Welcome to one of your first narrated lectures for the semester. This topic is one that you will come in contact with frequently as a nurse. And to be honest, it may not just be the in-hospital setting where you'll encounter a patient with asthma. Sometimes it's going to be when you're out and about, like say a basketball game, maybe the county fair, or may just shopping at a store. Honestly, a lot of people have asthma. So let's begin this narrated lecture with some brain teasers and thought-provoking questions. Then we'll get into the good stuff. Well, okay, what does a typical asthmatic look like? Great question. Here you go. Mm, okay, just kidding. This is actually how you would probably look if you were on the show Naked and Afraid. Not really if you had asthma. Okay, so what does a real asthmatic look like? That, actually. That's better. Asthma can occur at any age, and half of adults who had asthma had it as a child. So yes, some people do outgrow asthma, but not everyone. Bad news, actually. <clears throat> Most people with asthma actually have uncontrolled asthma symptoms. Well, what's uncontrolled asthma symptoms? That basically means that someone has asthma symptoms um, more than twice a week. Can you name one thing that causes an asthma attack? Hmm. Got your answer? Maybe somebody you know has asthma? When do they have an asthma attack? When do you have an asthma attack if you have asthma? If you answered things such as mold, animal product, such as, you know, pet dander, uh, pollen, dust, those are very typical and popular allergens. And pollen, oh my goodness, pollen. The, you can also have an asthma attack to general irritants such as chemicals, vapors, gases, smoke, and I do mean smoking such as uh, inhaling a substance uh, like a cigarette and I do mean smoke as say from a fire or something. Uh, dust fumes, viruses like the flu, humidity can actually provoke an asthma attack, high humidity I mean, and temperature like extreme cold weather. Another trigger may be stress even. I know right? So does everybody in nursing school have asthma? Probably not. <laughs> um, GERD. GERD can also trigger an asthma attack. What's very interesting is patients who have asthma as the result of GERD, if they get on a proton pump inhibitor or a histamine 2 blocker, they end up mm, having their asthma symptoms go away. So that isn't that interesting. NSAIDs. NSAIDs actually can lead to asthma. Right, I know, NSAIDs. Can you give me an example of an NSAID? Maybe ibuprofen or naproxen or naproxen. There are a bunch of different types of asthma. We also have exercise-induced asthma. We have child-onset asthma, adult-onset asthma, occupational asthma. That is where the person only has asthma symptoms while they are at work. And they may have gotten it from at work, such as like janitors and people who work with vapors and chemicals. There's nocturnal asthma where patients will only have asthma symptoms in the evening time. How interesting is that? Let's try a question. For questions like this, I'm going to prompt you to pause the slideshow in a second so you can read the slide, then replay it to discover the answer. Okay, pause. I'm assuming you've unpaused it now and you want to know what the answer is. Answer is bronchodilators. Bronchodilators are the first line of treatment for asthma because bronchoconstriction is the cause of reduced airflow. Beta adrenergic blockers aren't useful to treat asthma. It can actually cause bronchoconstriction. A type of beta adrenergic blocker or a beta blocker is uh, metoprolol, levetalol, 
anything with a lull in it. But I will say there is a difference between selective beta blockers and non-selective beta blockers, but we'll get there a little bit later. Inhaled or oral steroids may be given to reduce the inflammation, but they aren't used for emergency relief. So what is asthma anyways? Well, asthma is actually the intermittent and reversible airflow obstruction affecting the airways, the bronchioles and the bronchus area, not so much the alveoli. The alveoli can have air trapped in it. However, it's really a disease that affects the bronchus and the bronchial airways. Airway tissue is actually hyper-responsive to any sort of trigger, meaning the immune system initiates the inflammation process inappropriately. With enough stimulation, this can lead to bronchial smooth muscle constriction. See those bands around the airway on the right? Those are the bronchial smooth muscles. And when those tighten up, those can further narrow the airway from the outside. Inflammation is important to uh, help in ridding the body of harmful organisms or irritants. However, if the inflammation response is excessive or it's in the small areas of the lungs, mm, we might have a problem. I actually have another picture where it's a cross section of the asthmatic's lungs. Just take a look of what the normal airway is and then take a look about the airway on the right. As you'll notice, there's actually a whole lot of edema. Anytime you have edema, there is usually going to be mucus production. And because those smooth muscles are easily stimulated, those will constrict even further. So we have a really narrowed airway. Can we say ineffective oxygenation? So in a sense, the immune system of an asthmatic is overprotective or over-responsive. The immune system is triggered, the body sends out chemical mediators attracting more fluid into the tissue, the bronchioles constrict. <sighs> These airways can stay inflamed for weeks, the edema in there, and I'll be darned if another trigger is introduced and, during the healing time and then boom, the inflammation is back and sometimes it's even more reactive and worse than before. Can an airway get a break? Nope. Hmm, sure wish we had a medication that interrupts this immune response cascade. Oh wait, we do. We'll get into what medications do and how they do what they do a little bit later. Anyways, this brings us to our next point. We have to take good health histories to know the story of the patient's inflammation initiation and their symptom presentation presentation to begin to help the asthmatic patient. Muy importante. Let's start asking questions. How do you know what to do and when to do it? Meaning, how do we know what to ask and when to ask? Usually this just looks like a pretty casual conversation. You start asking about their patterns of symptoms, maybe the episodes of the present illness, like tell me what brought you to the hospital. And it's gonna be really interesting what you find. But if your patient needs a little bit more guidance, why don't you start asking them about the timing of their symptoms? Is it worse or better at night? Is it worse or better um, according to the different seasons? You know, like it's seasonal asthma. Or do they just have it continuously? Hmm, do they have it when they run or exercise? You can also ask if they have asthma symptoms when they have exposure to certain foods. I personally cannot eat Taco Bell's pico de gallo. If it's on a taco and I eat it, I instantly will start having an asthma attack. Well, so what do I do? I don't eat Taco Bell's pico de gallo. I have no idea what's in there, but I don't eat it. I also have asthma since childbirth. Um, enough about me. Asthmatics 
also will have an increase in episodes at night. So oftentimes we'll ask our asthmatics, do you sleep with a dehumidifier at night? Because we know uh, humidity can sometimes worsen asthma. Um, you can ask a patient about an upper respiratory infection. Did you recently have pneumonia or the flu or did you get sick? Because just having an upper respiratory symptom can actually bring about asthma symptoms. But what's nice is if you cure the upper respiratory infection, the asthma will go away. Let's talk about genetics. Do your family members have problems with asthma? It is genetic condition. So if mom or dad has it, ask, did they grow out of it? Or do they have adult onset? Or is it just exercise induced? Because that is likely going to be the case with your patient who is having trouble breathing. Do ask about habits, meaning do you smoke uh, cigarettes or cigars or do you vape? Um, also do ask if people smoke marijuana. Uh, I had a patient tell me one time, I don't smoke marijuana, I only do marijuana. Okay, whatever that means. So, mm, and then there is one more, an atopic. This is where uh, you can actually notice some eczema on our patients, and it is highly likely that they have um, an allergic type of sensitivity, and then asthma symptoms will soon follow. But it's not one of those, if you fix the rash, then the asthma goes away. I guess what I'm trying to say is check their skin, and if you notice eczema, there is a really good chance that they have a hypersensitivity to nature, pretty much, and they will have asthma symptoms as well. All right, clinical manifestations. What do you see here? When I see a patient with asthma, we are going to see an increased respiratory rate, like what, 20 respirations per minute? Mm, more like 30, 35. Um, am I going to see increased coughing? Answer is yes. Actually, for children, coughing is a very early sign that they are starting to have troubles breathing. You're going to see use of accessory muscles. Um, this is an effort to help them breathe during an attack. You're going to notice a barrel chest. Now, let me just note here, a barrel chest is with long-standing asthmatics if they do not have good control. Our typical asthmatics won't have a barrel chest. However, if somebody's had it forever, and they don't take care of themselves, then we can see evidence of um, a change in the rib cage. In fact, the normal chest is about 1.5 times wider than it is deep. So if they don't have good um, lungs, then their body is going to change to compensate for it. <clears throat> They're going to have a longer breathing cycle. We're going to see prolonged inspiration to expiration. Um, they actually have to work harder to exhale, so it's going to be like, <gasps> I think I said that backwards initially. They're going to have prolonged inspiration to expiration, and it's going to have a longer expiration <laughs> like that there you go um, we're gonna see low O2 sats on our vital sign machine we may see cyanosis there's two places I'm gonna probably be looking for cyanosis one I will be looking around the mouth the other one I'd be looking at the finger so be sure to look for blue lips or blue fingers uh, what do you hear if you're gonna listen to their chest we're going to hear an audible wheeze, a musical sound, like that. Um, if I were to hear a silent chest or no or absent breath sounds, I know that is a medical emergency because my airways have shut off and I better help in uh, prepare this patient for intubation. So a silent chest is considered a bad thing, not a good thing. If I want to 
think about it, silent means absent, no. There, see, did you get a good example of silent? <laughs> good. All right. Um, another sign of symptom, uh, this one's very important, and I want you to pay attention to it. Speaking one or two words uh, at a time. They seem breathless when they talk to you. To give you an example, they would talk like this to try to try to get the words out. Uh, that's called breathless speech. And if you see that, somebody is very winded and we may need to move a lot faster to help them with their uh, you know, relief of symptoms. I have two pictures here of patients who are your typical presentation with asthma. I know I showed a picture of a girl. This is how I would say your average patient presents. And this is a person with long-standing uncontrolled asthma. The one on the right, if you can't see the star. Okay. Diagnostics. Oh, this is the fun part. How do you feel if you walked in and see these vitals on your patient's monitor? Just take a moment, stare at it. Stare at it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you feel anxious just looking at that monitor? If you don't, that's not good. <laughs> I sure do, actually. This is a bit scary. I want you to uh, take a, a little file inside your brain and label it hypoxia. And any patient with, say, a respiratory condition such as asthma, COPD, um, pneumonia, cystic fibrosis, anybody, um, this is what hypoxia looks like for them. These are the vital sign changes that we're going to have. So just to reiterate, what I see here is, where's my little pen? Here we go. I see tachycardia. I see uh, desaturation right here. Now let me talk about that blood pressure a little bit, but down here I see tachypnea. Anybody with hypoxia is going to have those three classic um, changes on their vital signs. Now, what is the 69 over 38 about? This right here is because somebody is probably not getting enough oxygen and they are going into shock. Uh, they're developing hypotension. So on average, if somebody's hypoxic, I am not going to see a low blood pressure. This is a very special exception right here. You just really pay attention to these three signs and symptoms of hypoxia. All right. And if their blood pressure gets down there, they're probably unconscious and about to code on you, FYI. Anyway, at the moment, you see the vitals, you're taking it all in, you determine that your person next, are they conscious or unconscious, all right? If they are conscious, maybe a little bit drowsy, I would like you to grab some blood gases, some ABGs, arterial blood gases. Why? Well, this is gonna tell you if you have time to do some more pharmacological interventions, or it's gonna tell you you need to intubate this person and put them on a ventilator ASAP because they are not able to breathe for themselves because they are fatiguing so fast. Well, let's talk about what are ABGs. Okay, click. Hang on. Okay, sorry, what are ABGs? ABGs show the level of impairment or the level of effectiveness of gas exchange. So it's gonna let us know, are we exchanging oxygen good or is it impaired? Breathing, honestly, is a giant exchange of these chemicals in the blood, the CO2 and the oxygen. These ABGs are going to tell us if we have enough fuel, cell fuel, such as oxygen, as compared to our cellular waste, our CO2, and how much buffer you have between the two. And to know that, we look at the pH. Blood gases mean a 
respiratory therapist will puncture an artery and immediately run the blood to the analyzer. And I mean, sometimes they do physically run it to the analyzer. Uh, in one of our lessons, we're going to learn how to read the printout or the results of the ABG numbers. But for now, it's important to test uh, for a person who is suspected of having hypoxia to grab some ABGs on them. By the way, uh, did I mention that this hurts like heck and you'll need to have a negative Allen's test prior to an ABG. You need to have a negative Allen's test prior to an ABG. Why don't you follow the Allen's test link provided here and watch the video and then test yourself to see if you have a negative or a positive Allen's test. In nurse's terms, we want a negative one, and it means that a patient's ulnar uh, circulation is sufficient, and it is okay to stick the radial side of that one particular hand. And if it is not good, then you go to a brachial artery for an ABG. If that's not good, you go to a uh, femoral artery and once again those hurt so bad so you may actually have to have somebody help hold the patient's arm down because as you know restless uh, hypoxic patients aren't the most cooperative as they're trying to bleed, breathe mm -mm, no way here are some other diagnostic tests we can do um, as you see here, a serum eosinophil count. Say so what? Why am I going to draw an eosinophil count? Aren't those white blood cells? Correct. In fact, elevated eosinophil counts help us understand that a patient is having an allergic type of asthma uh, so rather than having activity induced asthma or a medication induced asthma. These are really useful to know and it can help us address um, and decrease the disease severity for a patient. You can actually track the progress of eosinophils and see how long they persist in the circulation according to what they are being what the person's being exposed to. We can grab a sputum on a client. Yes, let's see. There you go, a sputum. And yes, your eyes are not playing tricks on you. This is a picture of a, a person with no gloves handling the sputum. Delicious, no? <laughs> so uh, why do I need a sputum for my asthmatic patient? Ugh. I don't know. Well, think about the different reasons that they can have an asthma exacerbation. Possibly looking for a upper respiratory infection because we know those can lead to exacerbations. And last but not least, a PFT, a pulmonary function test. This is going to help give us numbers about our treatment's effectiveness and it allows us to diagnose a patient with asthma, PFTs. Here I have a slide that actually has some terminology of what we can gain and learn for patients who take PFTs. We should obtain baseline PFTs for all patients diagnosed with asthma. Which, reading, which PFT reading indicates muscle strength, respiratory muscle strength and ventilator reserve? The answer for that one is the forced vital capacity force vital capacity. This indicates respiratory muscle strength and ventilatory reserve. The most important numbers that are uh, used for a patient off of this PFT is the force expiratory volume in the first second of uh, expiration. So it is highly effort dependent and what a person does is they will put their mouth on this little mouthpiece, I don't know if you can see that. They'll put their mouth right here and the tech will say, okay, blow. And that first second of, <sighs> that is gonna be calculated and compared to other people of that age, 
of that gender and of that height and weight. <clears throat> so once again, it is effort dependent, the FEV1, and it is um, expected to actually decrease with age and with certain restrictive or obstructive disorders, such as asthma and COPD. Hint, hint. So guess what? COPDs take this test too. COPD patients, I mean. Okay, next one. The peak expiratory flow rate. This records the force of flow in the middle half of them blowing out. So you blow, and they're going to tell you, keep breathing, keep breathing, keep breathing, keep breathing, until you cannot breathe anymore. And in the middle of that forced, um, of that whole force vital capacity of you blowing out that middle number, it, this provides a very sensitive index of obstruction in somebody's lower airways, meaning how severe is their asthma? Is it down all the way deep in their lungs or what? All right, so the point. A 15 to 20% decrease in the forced expiratory volume, expiratory volume 15 to 20% decrease there, and 15 to 20% decrease there of somebody's expected age, gender, and size indicates they have asthma. So these numbers are how we diagnose asthma. And actually, if you look here at the normal and abnormal loops, check this out. You can tell by looking at the waveform. I should not have done that big of a... Yeah, there you go. You can tell somebody who has COPD, mild, severe. Oh, look, asthma. Here we go. So a 15 to 20% decrease of that waveform. Interesting, huh? <clears throat> now, um, what they'll actually make a patient do is do a PFT, use the inhaler, and if a patient has a 12% improvement after using the bronchodilator, that also helps confirm that this patient has reactive airway disease, as they so call it now, or asthma. All right, last test you want to know, the methicoline challenge. This is done if the diagnosis of asthma is in question, but do note that we cannot test if a patient is pregnant nursing, meaning uh, they're lactating, uh, and they can't perform spirometry test, or if their airflow is severely compromised. So there's some limitations with a methicoline challenge, but this is a surefire way to test for asthma. What they're actually gonna do is hook you up to a nebulizer, and they are gonna give you methicoline, which is going to 100% induce bronchospasm in a patient that is suspected of having asthma. Uh, to give you a situation, I wanted to join the Navy after nursing school and become a Navy corpsman, uh, join the Navy Corps, excuse me. And they asked me, do I have asthma symptoms? I said, well, I had it as a kid, but I don't have any symptoms anymore. Um, I probably use my inhaler like once a year if that and they said okay well what we're going to do is subject you to a methicoline challenge and it's a medication that's going to stimulate an asthma reaction and if you start wheezing then you have uh, asthma and we will not be able to accept you into the military at that point i knew for certain that i was definitely going to still have reactive airway disease and i told them sorry no thank you but uh, so I did not join the military, but that is a indication for the methicoline challenge. Oh, <laughs> forgot about that. Click. Those are the two most important ones. Remember this picture? Let's look really hard as the, at the asthmatic bronchial tube. And I'm going to name this patient Gloria. Now, Gloria doesn't wash her sheets in hot water. She has carpet in her house. Mm, she often goes to bed with her cat. Oh, and it's March, um, the time of the year where flowers are blooming. 
So you being a roommate, notice that when she wakes up, you hear that she is wheezing and you ask her about it. And she says that she's complaining of tightness in her chest and she's actually a little bit anxious and kind of restless. So what should you imagine you do to um, help make sure she has immediate relief? Well, first things first, you need to have her do some calming exercises for anxiety. Okay, no, actually it's not really anxiety at all, but you could definitely help her uh, calm and take uh, a couple deep breaths as best as she can. Someone needs to get her this. This is her rescue inhaler. We know this medication as albuterol. It comes in a bunch of different colors and name brands, but we're going to call it albuterol because that's the generic name. Do you know how albuterol works? It's actually kind of cool. It's a beta-2 agonist, meaning anything that has beta-2 receptors are going to be stimulated. These beautiful, lovely striae right here that encircle all of the bronchus and bronchioles have beta-2 receptors. When these receptors are stimulated, those smooth muscles, meaning, um, you know, the yeah, when they're stimulated, they are actually going to relax and open up. They are going to, um, you know, chill out. We actually just stimulated, believe it or not, part of the fight or flight system with this very drug. Uh-oh. We just stimulated the beta-2 agonist receptors, which are part of the fight or flight system. Did you know that beta-2 agonist medications, if in sufficient quantity, can begin to stimulate the beta-1 receptors too? I'm thinking of a very important organ that is full of beta-1 receptors. It goes lub-dub, beep-beep. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the heart. Right. There is actually... Um, uh, you know, well, I won't go there. <clears throat> this is the organ that is going to get the most stimulation if the albuterol medication is taken um, and it's a, can be taken excessively. And so we are going to have partial stimulation of the fight or flight system. So the heart is actually going to race whenever you give this medication. So yes, it's going to open up the airway, but the heart um, is going to be stimulated as well. So, um, guess what? After I give Glory this medication, she is going to say to me, and they all say this, all patients say this, wow, my heart feels like it's racing. Or they'll say, I'm feeling some palpitations or something feels weird in my chest. That's exactly what they say. Um, you, as the nurse, are not going to do anything Honestly, you are not going to do anything. You may just reassure them and try to let them know that this feeling is normal. Uh, maybe that would be a good idea to let them know before the administration of it, but at this point, let them know that they are not having an adverse reaction. Because remember, we are stimulating the fight or flight system. Now, if you keep thinking about that, <clears throat> if you maybe even can remember when you had a real scare of your life, you probably had this heart that felt like it was going to beat out of your chest. You may have had tremorous hands, maybe felt anxious or on edge, maybe jittery. Ha! Guess what? A patient who has albuterol is going to feel all these things too, and this is normal. All we do is we just reassure the patient of these side effects. Now, knowing this, how do you feel about giving Gloria this medication if she had a history of extensive heart disease, heart arrhythmias, or, ex uh, or maybe she is already excessively tachycardic, like in the 130s, 140s, or 150s. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's what she's doing. Sucking through her teeth. <laughs> the, my thoughts, too. So that may not be the best medication for her, actually. As much as I want to give that to her, Knowing what it's going to do to her lungs is one thing, but knowing what is it going to also do to her heart is another. So why don't we, prior to giving Gloria, or any patient for that matter, 
um, a good assessment prior to albuterol. So we want to assess their pulse first prior to albuterol. Um, we want to place the patient on a cardiac monitor if they have, you know, a positive history of heart disease. Maybe we could consider giving them something else that doesn't stimulate the heart as much, but it still opens up the airways, such as level butyrol. I know, right? Level butyrol. Another name for this is Zopinex. Now, why don't we just give people level butyrol and not a butyrol? Well, <laughs> um, level butyrol is effective. Um, <clears throat> for patients, however, it is extremely expensive. I know, why does Goss have to get involved? Let's not go there. But it's extremely expensive, but if a patient really needs it, then it is fine to give them the love albuterol. But for most patients, they should be getting albuterol. So, what do we need to know about these drugs to help Gloria? <clears throat> albuterol. They are short-acting meaning they have only an effect on these bands here. They have no effect in all of this inflammation. All of that here is still going to be present. <clears throat> so the only thing we're doing is relieving that bronchoconstriction, which is very temporary. It is very temporary. You hear what I say? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. It's very temporary. Um, a, we would probably tell Gloria in case she has exercise induced asthma to use it just before her activities, just before she's about to go play soccer or something or go for a run. She needs to use one to two puffs with a spacer every six hours. Sometimes they can make it more frequently than that, but you're gonna get super jittery. Um, yep, you're going to use it with a spacer. If Gloria does not have a spacer, did you know they actually recommend for the patient to hold the inhaler about one to two inches in front of their mouth and just spray it? And what's nice is when they inhale at the same time, those little particles, they are so fine, they're actually going to go down and get deeper into her lungs rather than her put her lips around it and then press and inhale. That, if she does that, then <clears throat> she's only gonna get the medicine to go to the back of her throat and like a third of it is actually gonna go down into her lungs. So really encourage your patients to one, use a spacer at all times. And if they don't have a spacer, they need to use a, uh, a technique where they hold it outside their mouth one to two inches. I know. You've probably yourself used it wrong or you've seen people all the time using it wrong. If you're not sure what a spacer is, Google it. Spacer for inhalers. All right, we are going to monitor their heart rate for tachycardia. Um, we have other drugs sometimes to give patients like um, their inhaled corticosteroids. Would you give the steroid first or would you give the albuterol first? Hmm. <clears throat> answer is albuterol. You actually want to give it before the other inhaled medications because it is going to cause bronchodilation and we are going to have better transmittance and penetration of the other drugs. All right, you're going to go into the hospital and you're going to hear the word duonebs a lot. Yes, I said duonebs. Say it, duonebs. That doesn't sound like albuterol, does it? Ugh. But what if I told you that it was albuterol plus something else that you could, um, you know, now I guess you probably understand the duo in the duo nab. So what else is in there? Boop, here you go. Uh, this other drug in a duo nab is called iprotropium. Iprotropium. This drug is an anticholinergic, meaning it inhibits the rest and digest system, aka the parasympathetic system. That is a great combo for our patients such as Gloria who can't breathe. We are stimulating her fight and flight system and we are suppressing her rest and digest system. This is a plus um, because 
hypertrophium has a longer duration an impact on the body so we're actually getting a really great synergistic effect for our patient short-term relief long-term suppression of the bronchoconstriction yeah now you can actually give hypertrophium all by itself but in the moment of a person not being able to breathe it's not as good as albuterol the main side effect of hypertrophium is the side effect of all anticholinergics and i'm going to be real with you guys this is what we say so don't hate me for swearing okay but the side effect of all anticholinergic medications are can't see can't pee can't spit can't shit I know so can't see can't pee can't spit can't shit <laughs> so what does that mean um, we are going to assess our patients for blurred vision we're gonna assess them for urinary retention uh, the can't spit is kind of like meh <laughs> dry mouth um, and can't shit assess their bowel status prior to now these are all relative side effects meaning only if a patient has these issues to an extreme would i actually withhold the drug so the fact that they have a little bit of dry mouth i would probably say meh <laughs> here's some doing apps but if they cannot pee at all and i'm like please pee on this toilet and they cannot i might think twice about giving them hypertropium and just give them say the albuterol um Anyway, that's why I introduce you to the wonderful world of anticholinergics. Here is the um, anticholinergic hypertropium all by itself. And if this is the case, a patient would use two to four inhalations four to six times a day. Puff, puff, puff. The long acting of the long acting version of hypertropium is Teotropium, also known as Spiriva. Spiriva. It is all the same information for hypertropium. For uh, basically, the, the same information for hypertropium exists for Teotropium or Spiriva. Um, we just will give somebody the Teotropium if they need more control, and so that means we need to teach our patient how to use a dry powder inhaler dpi dry powder inhaler because this is how spiriva is going to come or teotropium which is an anticholinergic um a patient wants to put a little tablet in there sometimes they just twist something and the cartridge will be inside and it will rotate around tell the patient to breathe in only breathe in only never out because if they puff into it, it will actually wash the medication out. They never want to shake these. We can shake inhalers, but we never want to shake a dry powdered inhaler. And they want to breathe in forcefully, like they are sucking the best milk that's stuck at the bottom of the cup. They, that. Or sucking a noodle in. Yeah, that works. All right, so they're going to breathe in forcefully let the patient know they will not see it on their tongue they will not smell it and they will not taste it because you know our older people are going to be like oh i don't really taste anything i don't smell anything let's try it again and they'll do it two or three more times so let them know they're not going to smell it not going to taste it not going to see it all right well let's go ahead and reset the stage here so we know how to manipulate this dry A around the bronchioles, but remember those changes are what? Short term or long term? Short term, right. We have to do something about all that edema in the airway. That edema, once it happens, maybe just from one asthma episode, takes weeks to go back down. You know, like uh, the swelling on a sprained ankle, how long does that take to go away? Weeks, right? <clears throat> So to make that edema in the airway go down and stay down, we need long-term maintenance therapy, drug therapy. Typically in an acute situation like say the hospital, we will give a person intravenous corticosteroids or steroids, such as methylprednisolone, also known as solumedrol. Notice the ending here, that ending sewn 
is used for pretty much all corticosteroids. So if you see that, you know it means steroids. Okay, so what are corticosteroids? These medications disrupt the pathways of inflammation mediators. Thus, its main function is to prevent further inflammation and the body can begin that arduous work of shrinking those edematous cells. Oh, what do we have here? Boop. A dosage calculation alert, right? Um, I want you to, oh, yeah, I want you to pause the slide and figure out how much medication you are going to give. Okay, so go ahead and pause it. If that is your vial and that is your medication, how much are you going to give? Got your answer? Does it match this? 1.44 ml. I hope you can get to this answer. If not, email me and I will show you how to do it. Okay, more about steroids. As you know, IV is the preferred route for severe episodes. We can give PO steroids for uh, a few days, maybe three to five days, say in the outpatient setting. But I must warn you, about PO steroids. If we were to give steroids to a diabetic patient, it will cause death. Okay, not really, it won't cause death. I just made that up. But it will cause this though. Yep, if you give your asthmatic patient who just so happens to have diabetes this steroid, well, they are going to have some high blood sugar. So if I ask you, say, an exam question, like which medication is going to raise blood sugar, you need to pick the steroids. And FYI, all steroids end with zone. Don't forget it. Like prednisone, methylprednisolone. Anywho, got to add a few more points about taking PO steroids. And yes, here I just have all these beautiful pictures here. And these are our things to know about steroids in picture form. Go with it. All right, the first one you see here means take steroids with food. Mm -hmm. um, and this little picture here means you need to watch for black stools. Get it? Can you watch for black stools? <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, because prednisone can actually cause an upper GI bleed if it's taken for a long time, such as like a couple of months or so. Anticipate your patient to get the munchies. Yep. Patients on steroids have an increased appetite and they will want to eat anything and everything in sight. Not a big deal, but they're gonna complain of being hungry. Um, another side effect is moodiness. Lay, uh, lay bile type behavior, meaning they're gonna go up and they're gonna go down. They're gonna be happy and they're gonna be sad. They're gonna be yelling at you and then apologizing at you. Uh, so that is just how steroids impact the body. Um, another side effect right here, there you go, um, is water retention. And it's going to cause the classic steroid side effect called moon face moon face it gives you this round like face um all right about the water tension retention excuse me this isn't a biggie um but it's a big deal if you have congestive heart failure renal failure or hypertension uh isn't that like all of my patients okay right yes so what we like to do, because most of our patients do have heart failure, renal failure, or even hypertension, and a side effect of steroids is water retention. Less is more when it comes to steroids, meaning give a little bit to help the airway return back from its acute state and get off them as best as possible. Okay, I'm almost done with steroids. I know I have a lot here. I have just got one more thing to say about the inhaled route of steroids. Yep, we can have patients inhale steroids. This is the preferred 
long-term management route for asthmatics because there is barely any side effect, uh, systemic side effects when they are inhaled. So you're not gonna have any of these row of complications when they are inhaled. And if they do, it's gonna be very minor. Here is an example of different forms of inhaled steroid administration uh, containers. These are all dry powdered inhalers, by the way. Patients must use these daily and it takes at least two weeks for them to feel like the medication is working. Are these uh, used for rescue inhalers? No, never. They are not rescue inhalers. You will actually die if you try to administer this, uh, or the patient will die if you try to administer this to them for acute attack. These are only for long-term use to get that edema back down. Because remember, our focus right now is controlling and preventing the immune system from becoming overactive, um, and it's going right there to the edema. This brings me to my last point about local immune suppression. See this here? Yes, it, it is a mouth, but go with it. See this here? When we take in steroids through the mouth as dry powdered inhalers, we want immune suppression suppression down low in the lungs that's a good thing but those particles do come in contact with our upper airway all the way up here in our mouth well guess what happens if we forget to tell our patients about the local immune suppression up high in their upper airway and we forget to tell them to rinse and spit with water after every use of their corticosteroid. This is what happens if we forget. They will have, um, well, let me back it up. Uh, local corticosteroid use reduces that local immunity balance and it increases local infections. Lots of locals there. And one of those is Candida albicans. We know this as a yeast infection or thrush, oral thrush. And you look at that lady in the black and white picture. She's like, ah. <laughs> okay. I think that's all I have to say. So if somebody is on an inhaled corticosteroid, we're not going to have as much in uh, systemic side effects, but we will have local side effects in the mouth. So we must teach them how to rinse and spit and have good oral hygiene. Recall time. Now, in any good lecture or lesson, you must stop yourself so many minutes and force yourself to recall what you had just learned. So, I want you to grab a sheet of paper, a sticky note, the backside of an envelope on your desk containing the paper statement of your cell phone bill, and for goodness sakes, hurry up and opt into electric, electronic statements already. Nobody wants to get a uh, paper statement anyway. But, all right, now, brain dump three facts that you just learned from mm, this past time together. Don't be like steroids are bad. Yeah, well, that's not going to help you on the test when you're looking at it. Um, no, it's not going to help you on the test and it's not going to help you when you're in a room with an asthmatic patient who can't breathe. And all you can remember are steroids are bad. I want you to go a little deeper, like upper respiratory infection can exacerbate asthma or ABGs are needed if a patient is losing consciousness and showing signs of respiratory distress. Hmm. Or I should assess something before albuterol. What's that again? I don't know. You tell me. Write it down. I want you to pause the video and then continue once you see how awesome you are and that you can actually recall info. This is super important to the learning process. It may be awkward at first, but so is a first kiss. You just do it and it gets easier. <clears throat> Remember that picture of the lion, you know, Simba overprotecting the cub? Well, that one drug that I mentioned um, that is really beneficial in interrupting the inflammation pathway is monolucast or singular monolucast. This medication is a leukotriene uh, modifier, a leukotriene modifier. 
leukotriene modifiers block the leukotriene receptor. Ha! Huh? <laughs> this prevents the inflammatory mediators from stimulating inflammation. That is exactly what our patients need. It's used for moderate to severe asthma, and it helps get that edema under control. A patient has to take this pill every day, even if feeling well. See that purple disc there? <clears throat> this is actually a combination drug. These are very popular for asthmatics for long-term control. It actually contains fluticasone, which is an inhaled what? Notice the zone on it, fluticasone. It's a steroid, right? It contains fluticasone and salmeterol. Salmeterol. Mmm. What do you think rhymes with salmeterol? Right, albuterol. Yes. It's the same but different. <laughs> oh, I know. So, salmeterol is a beta 2 agonist, but it's a long acting beta 2 agonist. What I need you to know about long acting beta 2 agonists is that they are used um, possibly alone or they are given often in combo drugs for better asthma control. Big fact to remember here is even though it's called salmeterol and it's in the you know family of albuterol, it is not for emergency use. They are not the same thing. Let me introduce to you another medication we use for asthmatics. Students, theophylline. Theophylline, student. Now that you know each other, let's look at the different situations where you will use or not use this medication. We use theophylline if all other meds can't control asthma. It's a bit of a last ditch effort for people who have relief from their symptoms. Way back in the day, this was the first drug of choice for those with chronic asthma and COPD, but use has declined sharply because of potential side effects such as dysrhythmias, convulsions, and cardiorespiratory collapse. <clears throat> With this in mind, guess who really should not be on this medication? Right, anyone who has a history of extensive heart disease, renal disease, liver disease, and those with seizure disorders. It has a super narrow therapeutic index, meaning the range for this drug is 10 to 20 mics per milliliter, but toxicity occurs when you are exactly greater than 20. <laughs> Great. So what does this mean to us as nurses? <clears throat> It means you will look for the last theophylline level before administering theophylline and make you make dang sure it's not greater than 20. And if it is, you ain't giving that pill. <laughs> um, oh, and this also means you'll inform your patient that when they get placed on this drug, they need to come back every three to six months to have their theophylline levels drawn. There is one more teaching point I need to share you. To share with you. Do, 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 do. <clears throat> Theophylline is in the drug class called methyl xanthines. Oh, look, look who else is also a methyl xanthine family photo. Yeah, look who else is also in the methyl xanthine family photo. Right, caffeine. What in the world? So <clears throat> I got good news and I got bad news. Bad news, patients should not be on any other xanthine while taking theophylline. <clears throat> Caffeine, um, per se, if it were given with theophylline, will actually have a synergistic effect on the body. And now we're going to have convulsions and we're going to have... Um, dysrhythmias and yada yada. All right, so that's the bad news. So people on theophylline should not have caffeine because they are in the same dang family. It's like we're in West Virginia or something. All right, good news. You can have someone who is experiencing asthma attack and you're like, oh crap, I don't have uh, albuterol. Ah, but I do have a cup of coffee. And believe it or not, the coffee will help them breathe better. Yep. 
it's honestly going to be helpful, but it's just really weak and less effective than Theophylin. But anyway, good to know in the event you're in an emergency, uh, somebody can't breathe and is asthma related, give them coffee. Uh, which, by the way, you don't need to memorize any of the pictures on this slide. It was just because they were cool pictures. All right. Whew, moving away from medications. Let's move forward. O2 therapy. You are going to give your patient a nasal cannula, and nasal cannula is going to deliver mm, about 24 to 44% of oxygen at the flow rate of anywhere from 1 to 6 liters per minute. Um, anybody know the oxygen content of room air? Cricket, cricket? Yep, 21%. So we're just bumping up their fraction of inspired oxygen uh, from 24 to 44 with um, the oxygen through the nasal cannula. It is really good if you are running oxygen greater than four liters per minute to give them humidification. It's like this little bottle and you attach it to the wall unit that you see here and you can deliver air. Bad side about nasal cannulas, they dislodge easy. So if somebody's desatting, please look at their face and see if it's even up their nose. Some patients put it on top of their head, they throw it in the bed, who knows. <coughs> My uh, little red blood cell here with oxygen, he actually is demonstrating a non-breather. Non-breathers are very important if our person is hypoxic or they are mouth breathing. And this can deliver oxygen from 80% to 95%. So it's almost pure oxygen flowing to our patient. The rate that you need to turn the dial up to is about 10 to 15 liters per minute, which is extremely important to make it go that fast because the flow and the force of oxygen will actually wash out some of the carbon dioxide that is oftentimes left in the mask, uh, in the patient's mask. Nothing like putting a mask on a patient and having less than 10 liters per minute flow rate and they end up passing out because they're kind of like breathing into a paper bag kind of thing. <laughs> so make sure if they are on a mask, the rate is anywhere from 10 to 15 liters per minute to help it wash out all of the CO2 that the person's breathing back in the mask. <laughs> oh man. Oh yeah. If they're claustrophobic, you're going to have to really talk them into wearing the mask. You may have to give them something for anxiety. Um, let's see. Make sure to reduce their energy expenditure. This means talking. Oh my goodness. Some patients, they can be dyspneic as heck. <clears throat> and you are trying to help them bring their sats up and all they are doing are talking to you. I have told a couple of patients, especially my chatty ones, I need you to be quiet right now. And they still keep talking. I'm like, I'm serious. Quit talking. You can't breathe. Stop talking. <laughs> oh, that sounds bad. All right. Um, encourage your patient to eat slow. We want them to eat, but that helps reduce their energy expenditure and their need for oxygen give them lots of rest periods between activity. If you ask them to sit up, let me listen to your lungs. Okay, lean back. Okay, lift this arm up, lift that arm up. Okay, squeeze, push, pull. All of those things are going to make them very winded very quickly. So I want you to go slow with our patients with asthma, especially if they're in an exacerbation. Um, think about scheduling your drugs around their routine and activities. Do you want to do it possibly after physical therapy or before physical therapy? <gasps> before physical therapy, right. Um, we probably want to not give them their breathing treatments and such before sleep, um, especially if you're giving them albuterol because they're going to be wide awake and jittery. Oh, I forgot to mention. Uh, steroids they also give you insomnia <laughs> yep I love steroids I actually don't they're one of the worst drugs that I could ever give to a patient because of all of the issues that come with it but <clears throat> people on steroids can't sleep so you try to schedule it best like way ahead of time uh, let's see position 
<clears throat> Let's put our patient in low fowlers or high fowlers? Yes, high fowlers. How about propping them, propping their arms up in the orthopedic uh, position? Um, we call that a tripod. Yep, you'll have their arms up high on a bedside table, resting over something, or if they're sitting in a chair, you can ask them to lean forward and put another chair, like you turn it around so they're just leaning over the back of it. Um, but yeah, that works a lot. Oh, you can also give them a fan. Yep, a fan in the room just blowing over their face gives them the illusion that they are getting more air. Um, have you ever been in a stuffy room? Don't you feel like you're like choking? Yeah, no. Um, so putting just airflow helps them feel like they're breathing better. They may actually not be breathing better, but it makes them less anxious. And a less anxious patient is a good patient. All right, I have got a picture here on the right. You need to stare out very closely. Do you see that one? It says what? Oxygen. You see this too? What's that say? Medical air. When you hook up a person's nasal cannula, go for the green Christmas tree, or sometimes they call it the green nipple. You do not want to hook up to this one. Well, what in the world is this one doing here? Why do we even have it if we're not supposed to be um, connecting to it? Well, it's a great question. Um, oh, as much as I want to make you go find out the answer, this is for nebulizer treatments. So think about kids at home when they're doing nebulizer treatments. The mom will actually hook them up to like a little air compressor and it will blow air and it will bubble and, you know, make the solution um, particles, you know, oh God, what's the process? Turn into steam. Oh, I can't even think of it. And the person breathes it in. That is what, that is the only purpose of this medical air is to run somebody's breathing treatments. Do not ever hook up this. And you are not allowed, it's a big no-no, to actually use a yellow cap if you don't have a green cap, you cannot put a yellow cap right here. That is a huge um, no-no as well. So green should always match green. Yellow always match yellow. I feel like we just mapped out like a game plan, like a football play. All right. So you walk into your asthmatic patient's room and you see this. The next place your eyes go should be this. Lucky timing for you because the doctor just walked in and says, hey, uh, how much oxygen are they on? I'm thinking about discharging them. And you're like, good morning, doctor. I was just looking at it and I see that they are on. Hmm, what do you say? How do you read this thing anyway? If you tell the doctor that the patient is on, pause here, two liters, then you are correct. And you just turn this little knob right here. You just turn that little knob if you want to adjust the liters per minute. Whenever the, um, wherever the middle of the ball is, that is where their liters of oxygen is. And just FYI, if I ever have a nurse in report that says the patient's on two liters, I go and I double check myself and I confirm, don't ever take what you hear in report as the current situation because they're gone. Who knows, a family member could go and play around with that, which they do all the time. Uh, okay, yeah. Now, uh, back to this photo. Which one of these patients is wearing the nasal cannula correctly? Or if it's said another way, one of these patients is wearing the nasal cannula wrong. Which one is it? <laughs> and it is this guy. Yep. You do not wear the nasal cannula behind your head. It's supposed to go in, like, wrap around their ears. So approach them from the front and lasso their ears.
All right, I do want you to watch the video labeled asthma attack uh, emergency room. I placed it in the respiratory module. And when you watch it, I would like you to listen to the narrator. Maybe imagine yourself as the nurse or taking care of that patient in the room. What clinical manifestations and maybe drug therapy were used to treat this client? What else could they have done to help him breathe? I actually have a few things listed here um, as answers. So don't read the, the um, PowerPoint notes just yet. Try to see if you can answer these three questions. And then if you uh, can, come back to this module and look at the answers that I put under the, in the notes section under the slide. All right, so what are our education priorities for asthmatic? All of these. However, there is one that is greater than the other. One is most important. Which one do you think it is? Any, mini, miny, mo. Got you. That one. Self-assessment. Our respiratory patients oftentimes live in such a chronic state of mm, disease. Sometimes they don't know how bad it is, how bad they are. They just think, well, I can't walk to the mailbox anymore. And us, we're like, okay, yeah, that's actually bad. Um, <laughs> it's like having a sunburn and you're like, well, it's not that bad. And then people are looking at you because you're the color of a lobster. They're like, oh, uh, yeah, actually, that is bad. So self-assessment. Patients need to know what it means to be in the red zone the green zone or the yellow zone. This all goes down to a peak flow meter assessment. They are gonna take a peak flow meter, they're gonna breathe their personal best when they're well, and then if um, every day they need to check it, and hopefully they were then 80 uh, to 100%, which is the green zone, and they are gonna continue on life. If they are in the yellow zone, which is 50 to 80%, they need to have an action plan, which is following you know, what you see there, B, they need to stay home, they need to drink more water, they need to do um, their albuterol treatments every four hours, something like that. Um, you know, rest, <laughs> take more showers, wash your bedding. Um, don't go to bed with your hair wet. Did you know that you can actually get mold to grow in your pillow? Yeah. Mm. Um, don't do spring cleaning right now. Not good for that person. Anyway, and of course, if you are 50% and uh, below, if you're personal best, then you need to go to the hospital. Once again, patients will be in the 50%, they'll be in the 45%, and they don't even think they're that bad. Well, I can still make breakfast. <laughs> yep, nope, not good. All right, um, they definitely need to know about their medications and how to take them and lifestyle management and changes, such as like, Take a uh, puff of your inhaler before you exercise, or please do not pet cats. <laughs> uh, oh, here is an example of my peak flow meters for our self-assessment, which is that important. Um, I'm trying to think what I have not said already. Ooh. Whatever their action plan is, make sure it is written down and accessible to friends, family, uh, and the patient, obviously, but encourage the patient to notify or to share this with others because oftentimes the patient may not be the best person to ask if they're feeling okay, especially if they're doing something they wanna do. Hey, you're looking a little blue here as we're trying to hike this fountain. No, I'm fine. Okay, <laughs> you know. All right, what is status asthmaticus? Um, sounds like a character in a movie or something, but status asthmaticus is a very distinctive, um, severe lack of response to bronchiolator, bronchodilators. It's a like extreme condition of asthma. <clears throat> and when I say extreme condition, anybody who has asthma can have an episode of status asthmaticus. It just basically implies severity. So what are our symptoms? 
Oh, no, oh, sorry. My symptoms were supposed to pop up next. Let me try that again. Ah, well, they're not there at all. All right, let's talk about my symptoms. Um, they're going to have high use of accessory, mo accessory muscles. Like um, you're going to see every single little space between their ribs suck in. Their shoulders are going to be, you know, they're going to pull their shoulders to their ears on every breath. So they're going to be like, <gasps> like their shoulders are going to move up and down. You're going to see distension of neck veins. Um, their, their chin will probably be pointing out forward, like jutting forward. They're going to have extremely labored breathing and wheezing. Well, how do I know if that's not a regular asthma attack? Well, you know, because you're going to try to give them albuterol. You're going to try to give them theophylline. You may even try to give them epinephrine and steroids. And if they are not responding to this, if you are not able to reverse it, you now know, okay, we are in a state of status asthmaticus. Um, and I must, you know, escalate this up rapid response team. Um, call an ambulance if you're at a basketball game or something. <clears throat> if it is not reversed um, in a matter of, you know, moments, I'm not going to put a time on it. Like, if you don't reverse it within 10 minutes, it's not really like that. It just depends on the patient. But if you don't flip it <clears throat> and get air to that patient, they are going to go to cardiac arrest and or develop a pneumothorax, which is where a hole is basically in their lungs from breathing from a high and hard breathing effort. So how am I gonna treat this? Whew. Oh, you are going to give them tons of IV fluids. They are probably gonna go into shock. You are gonna give them what we call a racemic epi or a, a racemic breathing treatment, which is epinephrine that you are going to put in a nebulizer and then epinephrine is gonna be delivered directly to their lungs and it's gonna vasoconstrict all of that edema in their lungs it's going to stimulate um, the when I say vasos vasoconstrict all the edema all those little vessels that are just leaking and pouring fluid into that airway it's going to constrict it halt it uh, it's going to stimulate our beta 2 receptors um, definitely make sure your person is on a cardiac monitor because <laughs> their heart is probably going to start throwing arrhythmias so you may have to give them um, some antiarrhythmic medications um, we're going to give them some IV steroids and you're going to give them oxygen. It won't be a nasal cannula. It will probably be either a non rebreather or if they start passing out on you, you may have to, um, or if they get unresponsive, you may have to intubate this patient. You assist with the intubation, I should say. All right, so true or false, immediate treatment is required. And the answer is yes. <laughs> Oh, we're done. I know you're so disappointed. All right. Thank you for listening. And um, if you have questions, let me know.